good. Okay, well, good. So I put together this presentation on the First World War. We're going to pretty much look at it in a nutshell what happened. If anyone has any questions during this time, feel free to ask me. I'm not going to rip your head off. Louder. I'll rip your head off. So the origins of the war. So before 1871, the country we now know as Germany was a bunch of other little city states. Prussia, East Prussia, it was all separate and you would now call them states in what became Germany. Now after they reunified in 1871, they began to build up their naval power so they could compete with Great Britain, which as we know and as hopefully you know, has, has had the best navy in the world for a pretty long time. So this kicked off an entire arms with race, building dreadnoughts, with their, which are basically battleships and stuff like that. And so in response to this, a bunch of alliances were formed between the European states that were interested in you know, getting together so that neither Germany nor Great Britain destroys them. And so as all this is going on, the Balkan states Serbia, Austria, Hungary, they're on the verge of civil war. And we will get into that in a second because now we're going to talk about the uh, alliances I just mentioned. So they called it the powder keg of Europe. And like all powder kegs, you're just waiting to light the fuse. So in blue, you see Russia, France, and Britain, which were the quote-unquote allies of this war. They all signed treaties, and they all had alliances. They gave each other aid, helped each other out. Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary also signed alliances early so that they could, they were all allied against Russia, France, England. The Ottoman Empire kind of came in Later in the game, they came in 1914 when this was all kicking off. And then at the middle, you've got Bulgaria and Serbia, the Balkan states, and, well, this next slide takes place in Serbia. So this is what lit the fuse to the powder keg. The Austrian Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, was, he was in Serhavio in Serbia on June 28, 1914. He was just, you know, he was what he did what public figures do. He was looking around, showing the flag. Well, these three uh, these three Bosnian separatists who wanted Bosnia to be its own country, pretty much, planned to assassinate him. Now, the first assassination attempt was a guy with a grenade. He missed and he injured a bunch of innocent bystanders. Now, the Archduke, nice guy that he is, visited the hospital to um, you know see these people, the victims. And this picture is actually the last picture of him taken when he was alive. He got in the car, him and his <coughs> wife got in the car, and they were driving back to continue their official visit. He took, they took a turn down a wrong street where one of the assassins was, took a wrong turn, this assassin pulls out his gun, shoots him and his wife dead. And so because of this, a bunch of anti-Serbian riots break out in that city. The Austrians really didn't care. He really wasn't a big figure to them, so they, they really didn't care that he was gone. No one important went to his funeral. But this was the, quote, damned foolish thing that would start the world war. And his assassination kicked off the July Crisis which was a bunch of diplomatic maneuvering between the interested European nations that we've already covered. Now, some of the opening moves of this war, after, almost a month after his assassination, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, where the Archduke was from to where he was shot. Now, Austria-Hungary was, they were supported by Germany, and Serbia was supported by Russia. Now, both Germany and Russia were saying, you know, don't mobilize your troops. Don't, don't do anything we could consider threatening, but they mobilized their troops anyway. And so this kind of kicked over more dominoes. Germany, and, Germany declared war on Russia. 
Russia invaded, the original German plans were to spread out their forces to fight along multiple fronts. And this is where we get the this is where we get the German strategic fear of a two-front war. And then through the 2nd and 7th of August, Germany declared war on pretty much the rest of Europe. France, Belgium, Luxembourg, England. It's, they basically took on the world, and it isn't the first time that Germany will take on the world. But this time, it's, it's just the first. So, the balance of forces before the war. The German army was deemed the most efficient army in the world. You were, if you were a male in Germany at the time, you didn't have a choice whether or not you wanted to join the army. You were conscripted, but you were highly trained, there was high morale, they really liked being part of the German army, they had some of the best equipment in the world, and at the start of the war, their strength was 700,000 men, which is, you know, it's a pretty good number. It's quality and quantity. Now, on the other side, the British and French, who did the heavy lifting for the Allies in this war, numbered just over a million men. And these were all, like the Germans, they were drafted for the war. There were some conscripts, but most of them were colonials. They were taken from the British and French colonies and sent to Europe to fight for king country. But um, they, weren't, they weren't as well equipped as the Germans, but this, they would have one similar piece of equipment that would, that basically tips the balance of the war in, basically into how this plays out. So that piece of equipment was the devil's paintbrush, the Maxim machine gun. It was created in 1830, 1883, and it's, well, if you don't know how a machine gun works, you have a gun, it shoots a lot of bullets really fast. So you could take 10, 20, 30 men with full action rifles, you can replace them with one guy to shoot and one guy to serve this machine gun. So with less people, and about the same amount of ammunition, you can hold more territory against more people. So this was a lot of the reason why this war was so bloody, because both sides had this, and both sides used them similarly, so that it's not about accuracy, it's you're running at a guy with a machine gun. He's not really aiming for you specifically, as you have to do with a rifle. He's just holding down the trigger, because one bullet will hit you, eventually. So this is the reason why this war was so bloody in comparison to the tactics used. So Germany invaded France via North Belgium. They, had, they declared war on Belgium, not the first time. And so they were invading into France, and they were very successful in this. The British and the French stopped them at the first battle of the Marne outside of Paris. They were about 50 miles from Paris, and Parisians could at this time hear the cannon fire. And the Germans actually built really long-range cannons that were able to, it didn't do much damage, but was still able to hit Paris. And that is, you know, they're close, they're able to hit this beautiful city, so it's a psychological thing. So. After, after the First Battle of the Marne and the Germans were stopped, the French forces then, they made the first move. They took the initiative, as they call it. And they drove the Germans back 30 miles so that they, they could still take pot shots at Paris and you know they might hit something, but it's not as bad as it was. And at that point, it was really the end of real mobile warfare in the West. So in the east, Russia struck first, they invaded Germany, and this actually caused them to divert troops from their attack on France, which was part of the reason why they were stopped at Mar. The Russian invasion stopped at the First Battle of Tannenberg, but by this point, the German fear of a two-front war was realized. Now why the Germans feared that is, you can only really focus your attention on one thing at a time. 
countries aren't that different from human beings. So if you've got a threat to your left coming at you, if he's your only threat, you can turn and address it with your full attention, your full force. If you've got two coming at you from both sides, Hollywood to the contrary, it's not really that easy to fight two people coming at you from the same time. Because they're able to use, they're able to divert their full attention on the you, and you can only divert them half your attention at best. So that's the Germans' biggest fear. And this will be realized again in a coming presentation. Now we can't talk about World War I without talking about trenches and war in the trenches. The Germans dug in on both fronts. In the West, it was to halt the British and the French to hold on to their gains, and in the East, it was to stop the Russians. Now in the West, the British and the French dug in, but they called these trenches temporary because they had, they found the German trenches, they sent wave after wave of people into it, their attacks didn't work, so they dug in anticipating Oh, it's just going to be temporary. We're going to be here for a few months. The war is going to be over by Christmas. The Russians dug in for defense on their front, and this was the beginning of four years of bloody stalemate. The lines didn't move much during this time. The temporary trenches became permanent, and it was pretty nasty. And, you know, personally, I really hate this war, because it's, it's just not that interesting. You, both sides were stuck in their trenches, they shot at each other, they sent hundreds of thousands of people at each other, those hundreds of thousands of people died. At very best, those hundreds of thousands traded their lives for maybe yards of territory. So, you know, I hated how this war was fought, the mindset of the commanders, and how just, how static it was. It's not fun just to watch two people sit in a corner and go at each other. It's, the movement is fun. Or at least it is for me. Now this is the anatomy of a trench. On the left is how it looks. You have a two to three foot wide walkway dug under, dug beneath the ground. You step up to basically you're on the firing line, and it's cut. The trenches are cut at 90 degree angles. So it's if an artillery shell hits one section of trench, the only dead people are in that section of trench because the shrapnel is stopped by those 90 degree cuts. And on the right is how, you know, from the air, how a series of trenches would look. How you've got no man's land, a bunch of barricades, your front trench, and then a bunch of supporting it. And it goes all the way back to where your artillery is and the mountains of shells that they shot each day. Now, in the trenches, the years of 1914 through 1918 were, they were very big flood years. There was historic rain in that, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think. You've got a hole in the ground, you've got a lot of dirt, you got a lot of rain. What does that equal? A lot of mud. So the mud, so the mud was a really big problem because it's very unsanitary, it's not very, and so it helped spread of disease, dysentery, trench foot, rot. There were massive rats running around, and you know, the rats would feed on dead bodies because when in Rome. There is also, you are constantly under bombardment from enemy guns. And this is where you get the first cases of probably PTSD, but they would never really know for sure. They called it shell shock. And this was, this is also where we get first that term, and then we get the term basket case from this because soldiers suffering from shell shock were sent back to the rear and they were put in mental hospitals and told to leave baskets. Therefore, if you are mentally unsound, you are a basket case. And so, if you average it out over the number of people who died in the war total and the time it took to for the war to play out, about 6,000 died a day. Now this is, this is just the average, obviously more people died on days of attacks and stuff like that, but on average, 6,000 people died every day on both sides of the line. Now we'll get into some of the notable leaders, and the next slide we'll get into one of the 
kind of tragedies in this. Germany was led by Paul von Hindenburg, their president. The Hindenburg Zeppelin that went up in flames was named after him. And Wilhelm II was the Kaiser, or king, of Germany at the time. England was led by David Lloyd George, George V, royal family, king, all that. France was, they had a king, but he didn't, he wasn't really there. So George's Clemenceau was very, he basically ran the war effort from the prime minister's office. Russia was led by the last czar, Tsar Nicholas II, and uh, we'll talk about him and what happened to him. And the U.S. was led by President Woodrow Wilson, who keeps us out of the war for a little while. to 1918. So it was four years and millions of lives. Really boring though. Yeah. It's just trench warfare. Uh. You guys good? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So this is one of the really big tragedies of this war for me at least. All the involved monarchs, Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas, King George and Kaiser Wilhelm, they were all related to each other. They were first cousins. They were all related to Queen Victoria, who was an English queen. German was actually her first language, fun fact, which is something you never would really expect for a British queen. She died in 1901, and Kaiser Wilhelm said that if she was alive when you know the July crisis and everything was playing out, she never would have allowed the three of them to go to war because they, they went to war with each other. Nicholas, Nicholas and George were kind of on the same side, if you use the enemy of my enemy analogy, but if she was alive, and you know I believe this to be true too, if she was alive, she probably would have deterred that war from starting for at least a few years. Did they know they were cousins? Yep. They were, they had grown up together, they had done a bunch of stuff together, They. They knew each other. They were family. So were they all Russian or all German? They were all, well, they were all, you know, they were British, German, and Russian, their ancestry, but they could, they were all related to Queen Victoria. They, they were of their nationalities, but they were all related to each other. So, this is just a collection of pictures from the Western Front, which is, you know, shows life in the trenches, just how small and clustered all wicked all is, and then the bottom is the desolation after. Uh, are those dead bodies? Like, do they usually just keep dead bodies in the trenches? Or um, I'm not exactly sure. Sh yeah, I'm pretty sure those guys are sleeping because they've got, you know, the guy in the foreground has a uh, tarp over him. Yeah. And so it looks like the other guy does, but it could be, they could be sleeping, they could be dead, or it could just be... Um, Both. Yeah, sure. Or they're just sleeping. <laughs> See, you get it. You get it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, so the first real attempt to open up a new theater was the invasion of Galliope. And this was, since it was Ottoman Empire territory, the Ottoman Empire was sided with Germany and Austria-Hungary, and this attack was led by the British. Now, this invasion was engineered by a man of the War Department named Winston Churchill. And um, should kind of keep hold of that name because in a few years he's kind of going to be a big deal. Just going to be a little bit of a big deal. So this was the British attempted to land at Galliope, which is near Greece. But there were heavy losses to both the troops they committed to land there and to the ships they committed to support that landing. And this attack was Churchill's brainchild, pretty much. And since it didn't get born, it was pretty much his political death. So most, peop most people would just would have been content to take their retirement, live out their rest of their life as a country gentleman. But Winston Churchill 
decided to join the army and earn his way back in, which would shape his thinking for things to come. Now this was really, because of the, how static this war was, they both, both sides tried to use scientific advances to break the stalemate. So in 1915 at Yerkes, the Germans start using, the Germans deployed mustard gas, which technically violates the Hogg Convention, which is, you know, what's all right and good on the battlefield, gas was against that, but what mustard gas is, is it blinds you and prolonged exposure will kill you, just like prolonged exposure to anything will kill you. Isn't it pneumonia and bleach? Um, I don't know. Possibly. Mustard gas has a lot of different uh, ingredients inside of it, but yeah, the main thing is mustard seed. Yeah, and it's, it's not as good as mustard, even though I personally think mustard is not the best. Yeah. So after this, both sides start using gas. The British and the French had stockpiles of it ready, but they weren't willing to make the first move because Germany did, they said, open season, and there you go. Now the British first began to use tanks in 1916, which didn't prove decisive. They got bogged down in the mud because of all the rain. They were really easy to take out. They were incredibly slow. They moved as about as fast as you could walk. So they weren't that effective. And so neither of these advances were decisive in breaking the stale the blade stalemate of the trenches. So as all this is going on, there are these massive battles taking place at Europe's where gas was huge. We're done in the song where the British traded hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of lives for just yards of muddy territory. Passchendaele, the um, they call it the muddy hell, and this this these claimed millions of lives on all sides, and it's it was all pretty much for yards of territory and blades of grass. The lines moved less than fifty miles between the years of the war. It was kind of depressing. Wake up, shoot. Yeah. Go back much. to sleep. It's, yeah, you wake up. That is if you got used to the artillery bombardment coming down constantly. And then you, you know, you'd fight. And if you won, you survived. So, now we're going to switch back, talk about the East. And in Russia, the public really didn't like how the Tsar was handling the war effort, how the war was going, this, that, and the other thing. So Germany, seeing that, decided to give a bunch of money and a free, a trainload of money and some weapons to a guy named Vladimir Lenin, who was, um, he's the prophet of communism. This was arguably the best move of the entire war. Lenin goes to Russia, takes advantage of this displeasure, and in 1918, Russia signs this treaty, but the Russian Empire collapses, and in the vacuum, the Bolshevik Revolution happens, and Lenin turns Russia into the Soviet Union, into a communist society. So this, you know, it was Germany's best move for this, getting Russia out of the war, but by the time they did it, it really didn't matter. But this would later turn out to be their undoing, and it would lead to the start of the Cold War in about mm, 40 years or so. Oh. So I really should have put this slide in with my other science stuff, but this was the first time that aircraft were really used as instruments of now what it started as is you'd send up an observer and he'd you know, look at the other trench, see how effective your artillery bombardment was, this, that, and the other thing. Now both sides kind of got tired of it, and so they started fitting planes with machine guns. 
Now the planes started shooting at each other. <laughs> and now we have air war. And so Germany had the advantage the entire war. They, the early fighters had, you have to shoot the guns through the propellers. So early British and French aircraft would, um, well, yeah, they'd shoot their own propellers off. But they armored it, but the Germans developed where they could shoot through the propellers without destroying them. And this, they pioneered the tactics of air combat. And this is where one of my heroes, someone everyone's heard of. Wait, if somebody can name it. I want to know if somebody can name it. His name is Manfred von Richthofen. Oh. Does it ring a bell to anybody? Oh. He's, Baron. All right, in Peanuts <laughs> Comics. He's German. Yeah, he was German. He's German, like, like one of the best, like, best pilots. Yep. He's in Peanuts. He's Snoopy's rival. Anyone? Uh, Anyone? That's a good one. <laughs> He's the Red Baron. He also has a brand of pizza named after him. But he, um, so, in, in fighter, in pilot circles, if you kill five enemy planes, you're a big deal. He killed 82. He's a really big deal. But he, um, well, in 1918, he was going after his 83rd kill, flying over some trenches. And a guy with a golden bullet in his rifle just took a pot shot up at him, hit him, and he died. So it's just, you know, like the assassination of the Archduke. It's history turns on the little things like that. And so one of the other really big fears in the war is the war on the sea. You know, both Germany and England had built up these massive navies and they use them to blockade each other, to keep foreign trade and stuff like that from getting in. England used their massive fleet, frigates, destroyers, their battleships, stuff like that. Germany used U-boats, submarines, and this was the first time they'd really been used in combat. Now the German use of submarines, and pretty much anything they suspected of going to France or England was sunk, their tactics actually turned opinion against them, and what ultimately led to the U.S. entering the or after, yes, the Lusitania was sunk. Germans said that it was being used to run weapons to France and England, but it did have passengers on it. But the Germans did say it blew up very well. So, might there have been weapons on it? We don't know. I, is the hill on fire? It could be on fire. <gasps> so, by this point, we're in 1917, and we're in the war. Now, we entered after the Zimmerman telegram was intercepted. Now, it was sent from Berlin, Germany, to Mexico City. And basically, the Kaiser was promising the Mexicans, hey, you attack America, you keep them out of the war in Europe. You can get your stuff back that you lost in the war, so basically you get Texas, New Mexico, California. Get that back. All you have to do is attack America. Well, the Mexicans said no, and they gave the letter to us, and um, yeah, we kind of went to war with Germany over that. And so in summer 1918, that's when our troops started, they entered their combat role in Europe. Now, the U.S. involvement was huge to the Allies. They were called doughboys by the French and British because they were, the British and the French were so tired of fighting. They were lean, they were starving, this and that. And so these, you know, healthy looking Americans come in and it's, it really revitalized the morale of the Allies and the civilians. And so they were led by General John J. Pershing. They called him Black Jack. And they landed in 1917, and they were given training to fight in the trenches, in the woods, and the lessons the French and British had learned over three years of fighting. And in summer 1918, they first entered combat in the Battle of St. Mihiel, which was the first, you know, I talked about tanks earlier. This is the first time they were effectively used. And they were effectively used under one of my heroes, George S. Patton, and he, um, well, before the battle, he went out to the trenches and, you know, you gotta say, 
The trenches were death wishes, and if you go into the no man's land between the trenches, you either have a really good reason, or you really have a death wish. So he crawls out between the trenches, makes notes on the German lines and different stuff like that, so his tanks won't get bogged down like the British do. And the attack is successful because of this. And this is the opening of maneuvers in four years of bloody trench stalemate. Now during this battle on this ridge, Patton and another figure who's also become, become big in a few years, Douglas MacArthur, they meet on this ridge. And they're both, you know, they're both officer ranks, so, you know, in war you like to kill officers. Well, they're standing up on this ridge. Their troops are, you know, taking cover around them as the Germans shoot at them. But they're just standing on the edge of this ridge, looking at the Germans, talking back and forth. And so it's, it really shows the character of both of them. And, you know, we'll talk more about them in a few years when they also become really big deals. So the Battle of St. Mihiel kicked off the Hundred Days Offensive. The last major push in the West, because by this time, the Russia slash Soviet Union, they were out of the game by then. And it was a series of Allied victories that ended in the armistice <coughs> on November 11th. And this, this was really inspired by the entrance of US troops. And this is where a German corporal named Adolf Hitler had two near-death experiences. The first was where we get the infamous Hitler stash from. He, um, the British gassed his trench, and he used to have this really no long, flowing handlebar mustache, but he couldn't get a seal on his gas mask with it, so he held his breath through the gas attack, and afterwards hacked off the ends and created the Hitler mustache as we know it now. And the second one was the British overran the different trench he was in, and a British soldier had him dead to rights. He had his rifle up, playground shot, but the British soldier just waved at him and ran a different way. So this guy, you know, like I said earlier, it hinges on the little things. He could have stopped a lot of suffering if he had just pulled the trigger, but instead he waved at one of the most evil people in the world and ran a different way. So the war ended November 11th, 1918. We now know this day as Veterans Day and they timed it so that it ended at 11.11 .11 in the morning. So, and that's also why when we have our Veterans Day parades and stuff, at 11.11 .11, there's always the gun salute, recognizing the people who fought and died in this war. Now after, you know, the war pretty much ended, now we have to talk about formalizing the peace. So all parties involved went to Versailles and France. Everyone except for Germany, who wasn't invited to the table. Mm -hmm. America and Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, typically, in, when Americans are involved in this, we send we have our ambassador do negotiations like this, or the Secretary of State. But President Wilson thought it was important enough that he traveled to Europe to work on this treaty. He wanted to help Germany rebuild after this war, to become strong, but not militarily strong, so that they could do something like this again. But the Europeans felt otherwise. They wanted to punish Germany for what they had done. And so, this led the treaty to become very, it was very against Germany. They basically had a gun to their heads and said, you have to sign the Treaty of Versailles, like you're not. And so, at, this, at the meetings, Japan, who I didn't really talk about, but they played a part in the war. They did very well in the Pacific at this time. They were on the side of the Allies, but they felt shunned at the treaty meetings. So that you know they didn't really like the they didn't like how it played out, and this led to their imperial ambitions, which will get them into trouble in a few years. And so on June 28, 1919, five years after. The Archduke was shot and the powder keg was lit, the war ends. So, this, you know, two very different things happen. Germany goes into the worst depression ever in the history of all time. In 1920, 
approximately two dollars was equal to a quintillion German marks. That's um, if you had, you know, if you had a thousand dollars, you could probably buy the country of Germany. Then, so they enter the worst depression in history because they had to, you know, part of the things that was established by the Treaty of Versailles was they had to pay back war debts to all the powers. So they printed out their money so fast that their money lost value. So your life savings wouldn't even buy a loaf of bread, maybe not even a slice of bread. Now while Germany was in the darkest of the dark, the rest of the world entered the Roaring Twenties, which economic renaissance, cultural renaissance, it was a very good thing. Roaring Twenties were awesome. I can talk for days about that. Now, at the behest of Woodrow Wilson, the League of Nations, the first attempt to make an international body of countries was established to enforce the Treaty of Versailles, but it would turn, later turn out to be a spineless, useless organization. But in a few short years, fortunes would change, everything would change pretty much. The world would flip, and we'd be heading into another great European war. But I'm going to save that for next time. Any questions? No. I'm done now. Okay. Any questions, you guys? Why did that guy just wave at Hillary in my shoe? He, well, it's, you know, there is, he's given interviews and stuff like that, and I haven't read that, but, you know, he, was, he might have just been tired of the killing and all this, and I mean, you know, this guy's just there. He didn't have a rifle. He didn't pose any threat to him. So, I mean, you're listening. Why should I shoot him? It, it, that's probably what he thought. It kind of also goes back to the whole entire uh, Christmas thing that happened. Yeah. You know, they were, they were, it was kind of just a situation of everybody there was, they kind of knew each other. It's a lot like the Civil War in America, how we were kind of fighting our brothers. It was a situation of, he, he's really, already disarmed. He has no, he, I'm just going to go. I really There's no point in killing him. You know, I'll kill you if I have to, but I don't really want to kill you. I don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. Let's live. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. What's your favorite Red Baron? The Red Baron. But honestly, though, pepperoni pizza is the best for my mind. <laughs> Do you guys remember that movie that we watched twice in a while? Yeah. Um, that actually happened. And those were the trenches. Okay. That those are what the trenches looked like. Um, so just so that you have kind of an image of. That. And that's what that's what life was like in the trenches. I mean that never the Christmas tree like they showed never happened again. How about the space museum? Okay, sure. But tell them why. Well, because it's the commanding officers on both sides really didn't like what the troops had done, fraternizing with the enemy, all that. So, you know, they could have, like we saw in the movie, I remember um, there was going to be a massive artillery barrage that day. And so if, yeah, you're just out celebrating Christmas and then, you know, the world's weight of an artillery barrage lands on you, a lot of people aren't going to have a Merry Christmas. So... That's why they reprimanded everyone stayed in their trenches. They might have taken a day off from fighting, but they didn't go and hang out with the guys they're shooting at. Hey, something else that um, I forgot to mention first period. Um, the Berger's disease, you guys ever heard of that? Berger's disease was basically a trench foot disease from World War I. And it was a horrible disease that that the soldiers got in their legs, making it so they could walk, things like that, um, because of all of the things that Michael described. Um, it was a horrible, horrible, awful disease. They actually found out that our soap lake helped to cure Berger's disease. And so there's a yellow house up on the hill that used to be an asylum, but first of all, the first thing it was created for was a hospital to treat soldiers from World War I, Berger's disease. So our Soap Lake has a, a very um, strong tie with some of these soldiers from World War I. It's one of the few things that they found 
that helped that helped this trench foot, this, this burger's disease. So just kind of a side note. Hey, did we try to know? Yes. And